first letter to the Corinthians. It be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight. Timothy chapter 6. to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, and verse 20. Luke, chapter 6, verse 20. Uh, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And we read this passage in our scripture reading. Most often in the public reading of the scriptures, we would read the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And, uh, but we should read it more often, too, from Luke 6, because although it's a quite different arrangement of the teachings of the Lord, both the authors of Matthew and Mark's Gospel were inspired of God to give an accurate record. And the selection which is given in Luke's Gospel is different but it's intended by the Holy Spirit to be so. There's no contradiction between them. There's no discrepancy between them. There's a certain amount of discussion may go on about the location where uh, the address was given from the data in Matthew and from Luke. However, the contents are uh, uh, quite uh, in accord with each other, and yet there's a purpose in this. Because you read the Sermon on the Mount, particularly the Beatitudes and the passages attached to them from Matthew's Gospel, and you see the point that this is figurative and spiritual language very largely, and it makes an, its impact upon you. We'll come to it. We'll talk about it a little later this evening because I want to go elsewhere first. But then when you read Luke with small adjustments to the selection of material, you see the other aspect, which is also implicit in Matthew, but it kind of hides under, the, under a dominant theme. And in Luke, it comes singing out, and you almost think that they're two different occasions. And many have thought that. This, this is a similar address given on different occasions. A different theme seems to emerge from Luke. Now, the Holy Spirit has seen fit to include both in the scripture, so we get the full profundity of the Lord's teaching. And we see the two themes that run through those beatitudes. So when we're, and I, I'm going to come to this, it's not going to be the starting point, but when we're talking about um, apparent discrepancies in the Gospels, apparent contradictions, not that this is in any sense a contradiction here, but when we're thinking of things that differ, some of them are due to our misunderstanding of the passage. We need to look much more closely at the details, but some of them are actually intended. Some of the differences are for our good. Sometimes a different aspect is brought out. So we mustn't uh, uh, forget that. And I'll come to that in dealing with the dissolving of doubts. Now, I said I wouldn't touch much upon the more trivial apparent discrepancies of the Gospels. But a number of people have asked for some examples because they have been assailed, not so much by personal doubts, but by attacks on the scripture. I would like some light or some information. So we'll begin with this. Most of the contradictions or apparent discrepancies in the Gospels are only apparent. And most of them, not all, but most of them are easily resolved by a little careful looking and comparing of the passages. They're not difficult at all. They only keep being repeated in school, RE lessons particularly in such occasions, because uh, so many of the teachers of these things do not have faith themselves and have been persuaded that these are errors and they don't look closely at it. And they really are ignorant of how the scripture works. 
and they don't research it for themselves. I'll give you some examples. Some obvious misunderstandings which are so easily resolved. Some are a little more difficult to resolve. They appear to be real discrepancies and uh, uh, things that don't match so much. But they are easy, not easy, but they can be explained and accounted for. There really are very, very few that are something of a mystery as to why there appears to be a discrepancy. You can virtually count them on one hand, the hard knots, everything else can be resolved. And uh, I'm going to start with an, an old chestnut. It's the controversial staff. And I turn just very quickly to Mark 6 and verses 7 to 8. He called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power of unclean spirits and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, and not put on two coats, and then the explanation that they're to depend upon hospitality and those who support their message for support in the future. But then we go to Luke 9, and many will be familiar with this, and if you've ever taught Bible classes, you've maybe had to answer these queries, this kind of query, many times. Luke 9, verse 3, and he said unto them, take nothing for your journey, neither staves, that appears to be a contradiction, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece, and whatsoever house ye enter, and so on. So, well, there's a difference at once. But then if we go back to... Matthew and chapter 10 and verse 10, then it becomes apparent to us, but people don't look these parallel passages up. That's the trouble. And in uh, Matthew 10, I'll read from verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes nor yet staves, in the plural, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And then you go into a house and you get support as you go. And you put those passages together, and particularly from verse 13, and you see that the problem is not no staves in uh, uh, Luke's gospel, but no extra staff. You can have the one you journey with, but don't take a spare. It's in the context of other things you mustn't provide, in the plural. So you have one, but nothing in excess of that. You're to live by faith. That was the instruction given to the 12 when they were sent out round the towns and the villages to proclaim the coming of the kingdom. And if only people would put the passages together, it's immediately evident what is going on. And there is not a complete prohibition of a staff in one passage, and yet a permission for a staff in another passage. And many of the so-called discrepancies are solved in this manner. Just carefully compare the passages. You could do the same with another old chestnut, the women at the sepulcher who saw the Lord. And in Mark's gospel, uh, they're too afraid to tell any man what they've seen. And yet in Matthew's gospel, they follow their instructions and go immediately to tell the disciples. And as they're going, Jesus appears to them on the way. Well, they hadn't seen the Lord the first time. They'd had the message from the angel. But one gospel seems to say they were so afraid they told no man. And the other says they did make their way straight to the disciples. And the solution is so obvious that they didn't tell anyone other than the disciples. They went straight to the disciples, uh, following their instructions. But they were too frightened to say a word to anyone else on the road, anyone else that they met. And any reasonable mind will see that at once and say, well, that's quite apparent. That's quite obvious. And yet that's so frequently paraded as a discrepancy, even a contradiction. But it's only an unreasonable approach to scripture that does that. 
And you've got the same with the two blind men at Jericho. Well, uh, Mark's gospel uh, and Luke's gospel say only one. And Mark names him as blind Bartimaeus. But Matthew has two. And there again, there's a great contradiction between the Gospels, so it's claimed. But of course there isn't. And a reasonable mind will look at it and say, well, the two Gospels that focus on one focus on the most vocal one, the one who cried out the most, and his particular healing. But from Matthew, you learn an additional piece of information that there did actually happen to be two. And then also there's the discussion about why there are two places indicated. The miracle occurs in two settings, as Christ enters Jericho, and on another, as he leaves Jericho. But it's easy to, well, there are several ways of reconciling this, and you can take your choice. I'll mention only one, and that is that at that time, there were two Jerichos virtually next to each other. There was the old city, which was now abandoned and ruined, with just a few tramps living in it, and within a, a couple of hundred yards, there was the newly built city. And so it's quite possible that Christ was leaving one and entering the other, because the main road passed through both. And that's the most traditional explanation from, for an apparent discrepancy. But there are also one or two other explanations, which I won't go into right now, because although they're very convincing and reasonable, they're rather complex to explain in a, in a verbally in a meeting. But you can study them for yourself. And then people point out errors. Another old chestnut is the Lord saying that uh, in the parable of the mustard seed that the mustard seed is the smallest of the seeds. And of course, people immediately protest and say, well, it's by no means the smallest of the seeds. But it certainly is just about the smallest one that the inhabitants of the land at that time would be likely to plant in their garden or in their small holding or farm. So it's quite reasonable to say that. Then people complain that it grows into a tall tree, says the Lord. And because we don't see tr mustard seeds growing into tall trees, but they do in Palestine, and, and uh, they get to about 15 feet, and they're very large shrubs, and they were grown for that. And the illustration, there's no mistake in it, the illustration fits the time and place very well. And those are examples of some of the complaints that are made against the scripture. But let me turn you to, well, you could go to Matthew 27. Uh, I won't actually turn to these scriptures. I'll just tell you about it, because it will, uh, I want to hurry through. But in Matthew 27, and verse 45 to 46, we read about the crucifixion, that the three hours of darkness took place between the sixth and the ninth hour. That means the three hours of darkness ran from noon to 3 p.m. Now, that means that the first three hours of Calvary, it means it started at nine o'clock. Nine o'clock to noon, and then noon to three o'clock were the three hours of darkness. And it's exactly the same in Luke. And Mark agrees with that because he doesn't give times for the three hours of darkness, but he does start the crucifixion at 9 a.m., the third hour. So Matthew, Mark, Luke agree that the crucifixion began at 9, and the last three of the six hours were the three hours of darkness. But in the Gospel of John, in chapter 19, we see that at the sixth hour, that's at noon, Christ was sentenced. So what's going on? That's way out of time to have Christ sentenced on the sixth hour. But it's fairly obvious through the Gospel of John that John is using the Roman method of keeping time, not the Jewish method at all. And if you assume that he's using the Roman method, well then, he has the sentencing of Christ at 6 a.m. 
remembering that they, they had the journey out of the city, all the formularies and the goings on, and the walk to Golgotha and so on, and uh, the crucifixion itself started at nine. But we can go further, because on very, very few occasions in the Bible is the seventh hour of the day mentioned, or the eighth hour, because they tended, and they do do that, but very rarely, people tend to move in, in these quarters, ninth hour, the noon then, and so on. So it's quite likely that the sentencing of Christ could have occurred between 6 and 7.30. They would still call it that hour, the sixth hour. However, it, uh, the, the Gospels are in accordance with each other. From, say, 6 to 7.30 was the passing of the sentence and the crucifixion starts at 9 o'clock. It, it's easy to work, for it to work, be worked out. There's no problem. But uh, now it is evident that John is using a different way of keeping time than the other Gospels. And that's now universally agreed. But the complaint complete, continues to be made. There's a total contradiction in the time given between the Gospels, when it's not reasonable and it's not fair. But now I'm going to bring you to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and we'll have a glance at this uh, matter of the Beatitudes. And it's so commonly said that the accounts in Matthew and Mark contradict each other in any number of ways. Well, they don't. It's true that in Matthew 5, you have eight Beatitudes, blessed are. Some people number them slightly differently and they make the eighth Beatitude 2. So you hear people speaking of nine Beatitudes. However, there are eight or nine in Matthew. But in Luke chapter 6, there are only four. Luke has a much shorter account. It's about a third of the length and he selects only four. And there's a reason for that, because there's a different objective for the two Gospels. And then in Matthew's Gospel, it's recounted, it's, it's conducted in the third person. Whereas in Luke's Gospel, it's in the sec second person. So there's a great contrast there. But I want to bring you to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whereas in Luke 6, that's recorded as, Blessed be ye poor. So there's no mention of spirit. And that's an example of what is paraded as a contradiction. Which well, isn't a contradiction. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's something extra there. And in Luke's gospel, blessed be ye poor. Some people say these are different uh, occasions when this similar sermon was given. But it can't be. They're, it's at the right time in Christ's ministry. They begin and end in exactly the same way. Uh, Luke has a much reduced length. It's less than a third of the number of words the entire Sermon on the Mount. And Luke also includes not only his Beatitudes, but four woes also, which aren't in the Matthew account in the same way. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed be ye poor. Now here's an example of a difference which is clearly intended by the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned at the beginning. Both are needed. The, the statement, blessed are the poor in spirit, means two things. It means blessed are they who have come to repentance, they're burdened by sin. It's not talking about wealth, they have a, basically they have a spiritual burden. They see themselves as condemned, lost, spiritually bankrupt, poor in the sight of God, 
unable to have his blessing and enter heaven, and they wish to repent. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. It continues there with repentance and sorrow for sin. So, blessed are the poor in spirit is talking about, first and foremost, our spiritual outlook. But at the same time, it's talking about our disposition, our attitude. Are we materialistic? Are we worldly people? Or are we unworldly and not materialistic? Both are in that term, blessed are the poor in spirit. You're warned, it's not just talking about your literal wealth. It's fringing on that, but both. Now, if you read it through the Gospel of Matthew, your mind is likely to be riveted almost exclusively on the spiritual pilgrimage content of the Beatitudes. That would be right, but not altogether right. So you'd say, these Beatitudes, as I read them in Matthew, are all about poor in spirit, great need of God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, mourning over sin. It's about coming to him. It's about being converted. It's about the ongoing Christian life, being concerned about daily self-examination and needing the forgiveness of God. And so it is. But don't leave out the fact that it also covers the materialistic or the spiritual view of life. It just occurs to me I can illustrate this by something that I saw a while ago. I don't know how I came to be reading it, but I was reading a, uh, in, the, in the newspaper a review of two vehicles. And uh, not that I was in the market for a vehicle, but I just read this review, what they call a head-to-head -head review these days. And uh, one model, it was a very small car, one model was from Renault, I think it was, the French manufacturer, and the other was from Mercedes. And they looked pretty similar, and they were pretty similar in their aim at the market. And the reviewer went through all the different things. He, he asked, well, which is the most comfortable? And he came up with the Renault, slightly more comfortable. Then which, which goes fastest or has the best performance? Still the same one, the Renault, just slightly. And he went through all these different aspects of uh, the car, and then he discussed the build, and he said they're both very, very strongly made for little cars and so on. And uh, he quoted some statistic from one of these consumer bodies that said that both companies had, at, surprisingly to me, a very similar reliability record. And then came the price. And the Mercedes was twice the price of the other one. So the reviewer concluded that uh, the other one was far better value for money. But, and this was the significant line to me, his last words in the review were, but the Mercedes is the one everyone wants to be seen in. Yes, but uh, you see, that's exactly one of the senses of blessed are the poor, the unworldly. If the other is a much, much, it does the same job and it's half the price and better value, the believer will go for that. He's not interested in the one to be seen in. He's not getting his satisfaction from worldly things. He's not got his head crammed full of worldly aspirations. Now, I'm not commenting on what you may buy. Many of you will buy appliances and different things, and it may make sense to you in many, many cases to buy the more expensive one if you think it's going to last twice as long or do the precise job you want to be done much better. I'm not discussing or interfering with your private judgment on all those things. I'm just making a generalization. We don't buy the one that's twice as much simply because it's the one we want to be seen in. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's not only about spiritual need and repentance, it's about having an unworldly and a non-materialistic view. Now, when you read the Luke account of the Sermon on the Mount, he picks all that side of things out. 
he leaves out spirit. Blessed be ye poor. And he makes the, he, he quotes points which Matthew omits, which are all along those lines. Now that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So we read it in Matthew, and we're focusing more on the sense that Christ intended about our spiritual pilgrimage. And we read it in Luke, and we're pulled up short. I've got to watch my attitude to material things as well, because it's speaking to that also. Now that's an example where there is a discernible difference in what's selected for us to read, but it is the Holy Spirit who wants us to see both aspects, which with our limited perception, we may not have adequately seen if we'd only had one of them. And that is something we mustn't forget. There's no, the only thing that comes near to a contradiction in that account is that in Matthew, Christ appears to be at the top of a mountain, and in Luke, he appears to be in a plain. But actually, when you read the account carefully of the place from which he preached, it could well, the two can easily be reconciled. He was coming down from a mountain, and he was on a lower slope. Some people even think they can identify it. And there he gave the address. And that both records allow for that possibility. But there's a reason why one passage selects different aspects and that's valuable and important to us and uh, one or two other things well the anointing of the lord by mary at bethany here's another old chestnut that you constantly hear about maybe you'd like to look at it from the gospel of john chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 and uh, i'll explain it to you this is supposed to be a massive contradiction between John and Matthew and Mark. Uh, John 12, chapter, uh, verse 1, I'll read from. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus uh, was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus. Whereas Mark and Matthew, well, they have him anointing the, the woman, who is not named in those accounts, anointing the head of Jesus. Oh, what a tangle of contradictions, the critics say, and so many of the school teachers say to the children. The first mistake they make is they say that in John's Gospel, this anointing by Mary, unnamed by Matthew and Mark, but named by John, this uh, anointing took place in the house of uh, Lazarus of Bethany. Well, it didn't. You read through John chapter 12 very carefully. It doesn't say where the anointing took place. It just said it took place at Bethany. It's very noticeable, it's very careful. So there's no contradiction with Matthew and Mark who say that it took place in the house of one, Simon the leper at Bethany. Well, John's Gospel doesn't contradict that. So this supper was held at the house of Simon who had been a leper who was healed by the Lord. And uh, no doubt it was a much bigger house and it could take the guests. So the actual meal was held down the road. But what about what happened at the anointing? It was Mary of Bethany. And John says she anointed the Lord, pouring the oil on. Well, she would have had this large bottle of spikenard runny ointment and uh, would have smashed off the neck and the oil would have gushed down and both accounts are correct. Matthew and Mark, the oil would first have run down the head of the Lord and then down his outer clothing and profusely poured on his feet. Well, both in Matthew and Mark's gospel, Christ said, she has done this 
against my burial and to anoint me for my burial. Mary, she understood what the disciples rejected from their mind. Christ told them repeatedly that he was going to his execution and the third day he would rise again. And they listened, but they couldn't take it in because naturally they didn't want it to happen. It happens with us, all of us. We hear some things we don't want to hear and we don't take them in. The disciples didn't take it in, but Mary took it in. Her belief was ahead of the disciples and she knew he was going to be arrested. And in her mind, she'd never get an opportunity to anoint the body with oil. He wouldn't get a decent burial. This is what she imagined. She knew that his words were true and once the authorities had got him and he allowed himself in apparent weakness to be arrested and taken away, that would be the last they'd see of him. And so in her great love and gratitude, she'd anoint him for burial then and there. Well now, what parts of the body could she anoint? Well, the only parts of the body that were exposed to a the Lord reclining at a meal were his face and his feet. And so she anointed both his head and his feet. And the Lord says, she has anointed my body. So both are correct. The oil in Matthew and Mark went over the head and John, when he recounts this event, most clearly remembers her washing, or not washing, but an wiping, anointing his feet with her hair. And so he records it in that way. But why they see contradictions in these things when it's explained by the nature of what Mary was doing? Now Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, has an overriding purpose. The Holy Spirit inspires Matthew first and foremost to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. He has so many Old Testament quotations. He quotes the prophecies. He quotes and he quotes and he quotes. It's written for Jews. It's written to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Mark had quite a different purpose given to him of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired him to write not so much a gospel as a tract. Mark's gospel is very short. It's punchy. It's in easy language. It's a tract. It's an evangelistic tract, if you like. And it's written for Gentiles. How do we know? because Mark repeatedly explains Jewish customs. So he's got Gentiles in mind. Mark even uses Latin words. He's got Gentiles in mind. It's a different purpose altogether from Matthew. And then there's Luke's gospel. Now that also is for Gentiles, but it's much longer than Mark. He is inspired to give a much longer account for unbelievers and believers too, of the life of Christ, chiefly to Gentiles. Then there's John's Gospel. Well, now that is different again, because that is, although we tend to use it for unbelievers, John's Gospel was quite clearly written mainly for believers. It's the deepest of them all. It has the most spiritual content it has much more emphasis on the doctrines of grace. Whereas the other gospels say you need to be saved, John takes time to explain whatever induces you to respond to the gospel because it's grace alone. He proves much more strongly the divinity of Christ and deals with the devotional depths. So all the gospels have their different purposes. And as they, under inspiration, the authors work out those different purposes, there will be differences in emphasis. And foolish people take them as 
independent individuals just stumbling about seeing things differently. And that's quite an incorrect way of seeing it and looking at it. But I want to try to come to a conclusion with a, a kind of, um, I don't know how much of this we can do, but just the, some of it at any rate, uh, looking at certain scriptures in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Matthew's Gospel. One of the latest uh, efforts of liberal theologians, some small number in particular, is to try to um, drive a wedge between Matthew's gospel and everything else. And so it's said, it is a different Christ who is presented in Matthew's gospel from all the other gospels. It is even asserted there is no word of Jesus Christ being God in Matthew's gospel. Now, if you feel dubious about that, you've every right to be. It's an extraordinary assertion, but that is one of the latest, very popular liberal assertions. That was, this is what will be filtering into the school RE lessons next. Uh, Christ avoids, it's claimed, any reference to his own divinity. He refuses to allow miracles to prove his identity. What a contradiction, they say, because in John's Gospel, the only miracles recorded are called signs, and they're given the exclusive task of proving the divine identity of Christ. So they're trying to drive a wedge between the Gospels. Well, all that's nonsense. And I'll just show you a few texts, and I'll stop when time's up. Um, but if we turn to Matthew 1, and uh, we'll look at a number of texts. Remember, it's a different Christ. There's no word of Christ, Jesus Christ being God. Uh, Christ avoids references to his own divinity. This kind of thing. We'll look at verse 1, the very beginning of Matthew's Gospel. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's a declaration of the divinity of Christ, however you saw it. What did the Jews think? Well, they expected that Messiah would be David's great descendant in David's line. And who else? Well, Abraham, of course. The promise made to Abraham and all the other patriarchs of the great descendant to whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. You put those two names together, their great descendants, you're talking about the Messiah. And that's the very introductory words of the Gospel of Matthew. You couldn't have a statement that more clearly says, this book is about the Messiah. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You wonder whether these people have ever read the Gospel of Matthew. Just glance down to verse 16 of that first chapter. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, the Anointed One, the Divine One, the Expected Messiah. It, it runs right through the book. You could see it again in verse 20. What is conceived in Mary, thy wife, to Joseph, is of the Holy Ghost. And then she shall bring forth a son, verse 21, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He's the expected one. In verse 23, his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You couldn't have it more emphasized in the first of our delineated chapters of Matthew, that this book is about the Messiah, the Son of God, God with us, the Divine One. The book is set up to speak of him. I I'm baffled by theological liberals and what they boldly assert about books of the Bible, which you only have to read the book to find they don't know what they're talking about. Their understanding is far short of reality. 
Just glance at chapter 3. This will do us good to look at some of these verses. Chapter 3, verse 2. John the Baptist speaking. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven. His way of saying Christ is at hand. So the plot builds here. And down to verse 11 of chapter 3. John the Baptist again. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he's speaking of course of Christ. And then there's the baptism of Christ. And you could go on down these chapters and look at verse 16 of chapter 3. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God ascending like a dove, descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. No sign of Messiah in the Gospel of Matthew. Why, that's just nonsense. And chapter 4 and verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, even Satan knew it. He said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And then chapter 5 and verse 17. Everybody knows it. Christ says, he speaks as God. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I am the one of whom the prophets spoke, he says to them, in so many words. He speaks as Messiah, he heals as God. And I could go to chapter 7. I won't read too many of my texts, because our time is up. And verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. What a lofty way to speak. He holds the keys of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, he presents himself as the judge of the earth. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And so on. Verse 23, the judicial words. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And we could go on to chapter 8 and verse 16. Every chapter... He is divine, he is God, he is the Messiah. And uh, verses 16 and 17 in chapter 8, I'll read just verse 17, following his healings, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. He was the fulfillment of prophecy. And there were so many wonderful passages which he could we could read when demons were cast out the Gergesenes demons verse 29 chapter 8 and they cried out saying what have we to do with thee Jesus thou son of God even the demons knew it's non-stop through the gospel of Matthew and chapter 9 and verse 2 they brought unto perhaps I'll finish with this I'll read a number of verses and this will be our last passage And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And the scribes said within themselves, verse 3, This man blasphemeth, as only God can forgive sins, they said. And Christ went on to say, verse 5, which is easier? to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man, his word for his messianic office, hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go to thine, unto thine house. And he arose, and he went, and the people glorified God. It's non-stop. I could spend the whole evening reading these grand texts from the Gospel of Matthew. Christ asserting his identity. He does so to the high priests. He does so to Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of Israel? 
you have said it, which is an affirmation. It's passed into the English language today as a vagary, but it's an affirmation. He affirmed that he was the Son of God repeatedly, continually. How can they say these things? The nonsense which is taught today by many, many people and liberal theologians, theological unbelievers, who must be in some degree intelligent men. But how can they get it so wrong and fail to understand or explore or research the things for themselves? Well, it only proves the scripture, the prejudice of the human heart against God while we're unsaved and while we're in unbelief. That's what we see in all these things. There are very few passages in the Gospels that present any real problem to us. They're usually about very small things and we can't quite figure it out. But we'll see it one day and they are so few. Dear friends, most of the accusations are just nonsense. This is the word of God. And when we come at it as we do, believing it, we see what seems to be a discrepancy for our own satisfaction. We chase it until, in most cases, we've resolved it satisfactorily. We look at the other passages and we praise God and give thanks to God. Where we see a different emphasis from gospel to gospel, no contradiction, a different emphasis, we learn from it. We say that is intended by the Holy Spirit, as in the example that I gave earlier of blessed are the poor in spirit, that dual sense in the Lord's profound words, our spiritual pilgrimage, our attitude to material things, it's both are to be seen. And the differences in the passages selected of the Sermon on the Mount between Matthew and Luke emphasize both streams of thought. That's marvelous in my estimation because we trust the scripture, we see twice as much.